Welcome to the Uber Brands Podcast. Today I'm talking to the co-founder of Raleigh Denim Workshop, Viktor Litvinenko. Raleigh is becoming one of the denims of choice for fans of the slow fashion movement. Garments are handcrafted to last, but they're unpretentious, a quiet sign of sophistication if you like. Victor and his wife Sarah have been at it for about 10 years. They've grown from two sewers, basically themselves, to over 20. They're at Barney's and many stores around the US and the world. And they've been admitted to the COVID at CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designers of America, which is to say they're probably quite successful at what they're doing. We'll be talking about their mission of smithing the perfect gene, and you'll be hearing the romantic story that they live around that mission. But at the same time, you'll also hear that questions around scaling and growth are much tougher to answer for Victor. Might that be a good thing? Will they be around for the next 10 years? You'll be the judge. Look at our website for more materials on this case study and others. And if you want our help in elevating your own brand to Uber Brands status, then contact us at info at uberbrands.com. Enjoy. Please listen carefully. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Uber Brands, the podcast in which we discuss brands that are desired beyond price, performance, and sometimes even reason. Brands that seduce, rather than sell, that add myth to the material and shine from the inside out. We call them Uber Brands, and we, that is your host, JP Kurwein, and occasional co-host and co-author Wolfgang Schaefer, who's not around today, but today I'm honored, excited, delighted to have Viktor Litvinenko with me. Hello, Viktor. Hello, how are you? Excellent. I hear you clear and well. We're talking over the phone because Victor is in Raleigh and that is where his workshop is and it's called the Raleigh Denim Workshop. That makes a lot of sense. Hey Victor, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Let us start out with telling our listeners about your workshop. Not everyone might be aware of it quite yet. What is Raleigh Denim and maybe what's special about it? What inspired you to do it? Well, so Raleigh Denim is a, was a project that my wife, Sarah Yarborough, and I started about 10 years ago in 2007 in our apartment. Sarah was still in school at um, North Carolina State University and I had recently graduated. And, and we had just really fall, fallen in love with denim making in our apartment. And we bought a couple sewing machines and started making jeans by hand with a complete focus on quality and craft and in a way wanting to celebrate the history of denim but to make things that were relevant for the modern market. Now one doesn't just start doing some denim and buying machines. Was there some kind of eureka moment? What, what happened for you to decide to cut your own denim and buy machines necessary to actually put them together. <laughs> I know, it sounds crazy. It was crazy. Um, it still might feel that way too. We, um, it, the inspiration came from a few different things. I was, uh, I was really into cooking and I cooked um, in North Carolina at, at one of the best restaurants in, in North Carolina called Second Empire, uh, where I studied French cooking um, and the idea of taking ordinary ingredients and then doing something to them to making to make them extraordinary, got into wine making and and love these. Uh, I made wine for six years also in my garage, my mom's garage, and I love these elements of, of the great winemakers uh, creating a seasonal product, completely focused on quality over quantity. They would go through the vineyards and trim grapes so that the, the grapes that they had left were better, and and somehow there was this question between a lot of those ideas and the denim production. So I had been making the wine and I was up in the um, mountains of North Carolina and I ended up meeting two mechanics that worked at the denim factory, like one of the last big denim factories in America. And we just became friends and I was really, really into the machines and I don't know, there, I mean there were also just things happening in the market at that time, people wanting to know where their food came from and why it exists and just felt like there were these points that were all kind of in the collective unconscious of America that were kind of dripping in to to the market in different ways. Now it's interesting you talk about the collective unconscious that gets us a little bit into what we call mission and meaning driven brands. When I looked at your website, 
you talk about North Carolina, you talk about, you know, being very linked actually to the state motto of to be rather than seem. You talk about being about making stuff, which you just talked about, even stuffed squirrels. You'll have to tell you about that part. Can you tell us a little bit about what's special about your jeans, both the product as well as the spirit with which they're made? The North Carolina motto of to be rather than to seem um, resonated with us in a, in a profound way, especially in the clothing and especially in the denim industry where many brands are, I don't think they're so focused on the actual product. Uh, they're more focused on an image or uh, a marketing campaign. And, and we were just wanting to make the absolute best gene on the planet. And that still is what we're trying to do. For us, that, that came from a lot of different places, but the first obvious thing was to deconstruct the gene and elevate every single part of it, from the fabric to the thread, the zippers, the labels, the construction, how it was made, where it was made, why it was made, in what quantities it was made. And those were the first, that was kind of the low hanging fruit for us. So we worked with the mill that was uh, the oldest mill in, North, uh, in, in the country, uh, that was about an hour away from our shop. I started buying and repairing old machines and building new parts for them. Um, we very serendipitously came uh, upon a woman who was the pattern maker at Levi's in the 60s and 70s and have been making denim patterns ever since. She That's Chris Ellsberg? Yeah, Crystal Ellsberg. Right. And so she's been working, we've been working with her, she's been working with us for, I guess, eight and a half, nine years now. And so, you know, in a way we are her bosses, but we're like, she's very much our mentor and teaches us uh, every day about patterns, about construction, about you know, doing things the right way. And you very much romanticize the machines, the buttonholes, the stitching, the seams. I mean, you have a whole series of videos I saw on the internet where you explain the machine and it's almost a how-to video, uh, except that probably not a lot of people will have these machines left, which are, I think, from the 60s or maybe even earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the oldest machines that we use in production are from the 30s and the newest machines are probably from the 90s. I think that the ones that speak to me most are the, the machines from the 1940s or so. Um, our buttonhole machine, our hemming machine, our belt loop machine. So we've got a, quite a few from that time frame. And, and I think what's most romantic about it to me is that they were made in what I think of was a golden age of manufacturing in America where made in America really meant something and it meant quality. And I love the idea that that these machines were so well built in that time that we can use them now, 70, 80 years later, as tools to build our genes with the same philosophy. Some of them make better stitches, some of them do the same stitch as a new machine, some of them are no, no better, no worse, um, but that part of it resonates with me in my heart every mm. day. But you said it's beyond a love story and romanticism, right? You have quite a modern part of a mission that you try to live, is that right? Well, absolutely. I mean, this is not about recreating the past. It's about learning uh, and paying respect to the history of denim production, specifically in North Carolina. But we want to do something that, and, and we are doing something uh, with modern fits and modern detailing that's relevant today. If I'm a classic CPG marketer, I will challenge you and say, are these genes made on old machines really superior, quote unquote, in any way? Could I do a blind test and would I notice that I wear your genes versus others? And how would I notice? It's a hard question to answer. I mean, if you know a lot about uh, clothing manufacturing, uh, it's pretty obvious to see. Um, uh, our Japanese distributor, I had a call with our Japanese distributor last night and they showed the CEO of a very, very well-known brand in Japan, one of our pairs of jeans, and they very quickly said, this is one of the higher quality jeans they've ever seen. Um, and this is a person who is a CEO of a very big company, um, so they know what to look for. Uh, I think to the average consumer, what I want and, and what we talk about with every single person that touches our jeans in the production is that I want people to feel it in their heart when they pick up the gene that that they might 
not understand what the quality of fabric is or what the quality of the thread is or what the quality of the construction is. But when you sit down in a Ferrari, you know that you're in something that has been uh, meticulously made and that is powerful and that is beautiful. Um, the other thing that I, I think a lot about is a food term called umami, um, which is the, they say, the, the sixth taste. And, and it has this element of finesse and power uh, that's hard to quantify and it's hard to say. But when you taste something with that has umami, you know, tomatoes, mushrooms, truffle, these kinds of things, you know it and you right. feel it, even if you don't know what it is or why it is. And, and I saw some of your videos where you go into quite some detail explaining why the thread sticks out in a certain way and then you hand re-thread them to disappear under a seam, etc., etc. Are you obsessive by nature? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and and it, it does come at a price. I mean, just to give listeners an idea, I mean, what does a good pair, and I guess they're all good pairs, I should say, uh, of Raleigh denim cost? It's a, it's a pretty broad range. But it starts at about $185 and then can go up to, I don't know, around $400. The bulk of the line is between $200 and $250. And so who would be your quote-unquote competition? Who do I choose between, um, you know, when, when I look at your jeans? Hmm. It's, it's really hard to say. We sit on the shelf beside um, brands that are more focused on fashion, other American denim brands, but what we're doing is different and our, our motive is different and I think our, our, our target demographic is different as well. Do, do you have a certain, we call them Uber target, do you have a certain consumer or buyer wearer in mind as you design your fashions and does it turn out that they are actually the ones buying it? Yeah, so absolutely we have a target in mind. But it's not maybe your stereotypical kind of target. It's not a demographic. It's not an age range. It's not a income level. It's a, a care for how and why things are made. That is like reaching from 16-year-old kids in high school that are mowing lawns all summer to come in and buy one pair of rally denim jeans that they end up wearing for the next three years to you know people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 70s who care about details, who care about quality, who want to support the work that we're doing in America, I think also are just buying less overall, like one great pair of jeans rather than two or three, whatever it is. Um, but I think a realization that, that we don't need as many things as we might have, so let's buy less, but buy better. So how do you find and convince people who want less to buy another pair of jeans because I'm sure they already own one. Who are your fans? I mean, our, our fans are, are really that demographic too. They're the same people that want to know about where and why. And, and I think that changes the way that we approach sales. Uh, don't really think about sales. and anywhere. Um, But it's just about education. So the, the videos that you were talking about all we want to do is show people and teach people and share what we do, why we do it, and, and how we do it. And then make, let them make their own decision about if it's worth it, or if it's right for them, or, or anything. When we talked earlier, you were telling me about these pilgrimages, quote unquote, that people make where they either come to Raleigh outright to visit your workshop, or at least on a stopover, you know, take a taxi to come there, etc. What do you think they are coming for? I mean, they can buy it at Barney's and I guess, you know, on your online store. Why they come to the store and you say they visit your workshop as well, which is right behind? Yeah, so our, our store and our workshop are an interesting experience uh, that I don't think the average American has, has seen. So when you walk into our store and you see the store, you look up and there's a texture of brown paper and you look at it and you wonder what it is. And at the same time, you hear the machine and then you're looking up like a child wondering about you know, what they are. You realize they're paper airplanes and then you wonder how many there are and then you wonder how we got them up there. And then you're hearing these machines and you look left and there's 6,000 square feet and 15 or 20 people 
sewing on these old sewing machines. And that's before you even take a look at anything in the store. It's an opportunity to see how clothing is made. And that just doesn't happen in America very much. So I think, you know, every single week we get somebody that drives up on a Saturday from Charleston and they say, we woke up this morning, we drove straight here, we're going to get some jeans and go have lunch and then we're going to drive home. Or uh, we're from Los Angeles and we just, we have a layover at the airport, we took a taxi here just to buy a couple pairs of jeans and then we're going straight back to the airport. And in the beginning it was so, it was just so amazing to hear people seek us out that deliberately and it still blows my mind, but it's happening so frequently that but there's, there's obviously something there. It reminds me of the literally pilgrimages that I heard about from the CMO of Shinola, for example, in um, Detroit, or the pilgrimages that friends of mine do when they ever they visit us here in New York. They go all the way to Vermont, uh, particularly if they have kids, to go and visit the Ben and Jerry's, you know, oh, yeah. plant. You put what we call in our book, the truth, i.e. the manifestation of what your brand is up front, like you describe it, because you're all about the attention of the detail and the love and the making of the product, the machines, the seams, the people who work there. I think you even have developed your own language, right, to a bit, because I think you call yourself jeans smiths. Is that right? Yeah. And is, it, yeah, it, on, is, our, on our labels, um, we say that the uh, jeans are handcrafted by non-automated gene smiths <laughs> and and that's because this craft of clothing clothing making i don't even want to call it manufacturing with the, the care that we put into the jeans that we make um it's a different mindset and and we did actually have to i mean i don't know create or invent uh, that word to share how important that process is and how important the people behind that process are and that we can't make things of the quality that we want and need without a team of people that are as dedicated as we are. And you talk a lot about the people. How do you spread that enthusiasm, I guess, to, to make these genes? What kind of person hires with you and do they stay? Um, most of the people that we work with at this point um, have been with us for years, three, four, five, six years. And one of the things that we do to, to kind of keeps people um, accountable and, and gives them a great sense of pride um, is that after they become very, very good uh, at the job, we have a, a ceremony. Uh, we invite everyone from the company to come down to the, the workshop floor and we give this person a Sharpie and then they get to start signing their name on the inside of each gene. And, and for a little context there, in the beginning, my wife and I were making every single pair ourselves. So we would hand sign every single pair and uh, addition number the leather patch because it was our design and our craft. Uh, and that's what great craftspeople do and great artists do is they sign and addition their, their work. So we started doing that. Uh, but as we've grown, that's the thing that, that we feel like it's incredibly important that every single person that that is involved in the process at a very high level has some, I want to say ownership in a way, um, and, and pride in the work that they're doing. Uh, that's what we call myth in the making. Um, it reminds me of uh, an interview we had with Le Kritz, which is a Danish licorice maker, and they put the name of the person who made the batch of licorice um, on the box and they actually then started to receive emails saying I want to reorder your licorice but please give me a batch made by John, Jill or whoever oh, wow. um, because I like the last one. That's beautiful. You, you build a little business, you have um, I guess um, enough sales to employ, you said uh, about 20 people. What's the ultimate goal? Um, I mean, do you want to replace Levi's? Um, where are you going with that? In fact, maybe I should ask the other way around. How, how do you count on surviving in the world of, of Levi's? Well, we're doing something different. Um, and so I don't think it's about what anybody, any other brand is doing. Uh, I mean, the thing that motivates us is that we're trying to make the best jeans 
that we can and that doesn't really involve anyone else that that comes from us and we've been around for 10 years so we're doing something right and scale is not the the goal uh if scale happens because people like what we're doing that's fine but there's no artificial push for some artificial growth number we have a a beautiful team that we feel like our family it's grown almost every year at, at different rates but by our choice and everyone loves the work that they do this is that's really the motive so it's interesting you talk about there's no artificial growth i think you said or no artificial push for growth like there's no there's no like there's no promotion discount oh well, no none of that but, but also just like we don't say oh we need to grow by x percent this year from some who knows what number like we're trying to build great partnerships with our wholesale accounts uh, in America and across the world. We want to provide the best customer service and the best product that we can. And, you know, if we stay the same size as we are, we have a really beautiful group of people that we work with. We're making a great product that we're proud of. And in a way, there's no need for it. Like, if it happens, great. And if it doesn't, we don't really care. So your end game is not to find an investor who wants to acquire that business and those investors usually look at growth paths or at least at potential growth? I, I, that's, that's not what gets us up in the morning. <laughs> I mean, if we were trying to make the most amount of money, we could have done that in a lot of other ways a lot faster. And, and I just want to say, we didn't stage the fact that you have a freight train going on in the back. <laughs> that, that, is, that is coincidence indeed. Yeah, sorry. We, we, our shop is actually right beside the, the train station. It might happen again. Are you doing any kind of formal advertisement? We, we don't really. I mean, we, we just, in the past couple of months, started doing some um, very low-level online advertising. But those are the first ads that we placed in, in 10 years. And it's really just to share some of the videos that we've been making and, and educate um, a little bit about what we're doing. I mean, really the strategy is, is word of mouth. And, and it's a very old school strategy. When we find wholesale accounts that we want to work with that have been around, that care about the products they sell, that have built a business, a group of clients that they serve, uh, and that they want to share new things, and then we work with them. And some seasons it's zero new accounts, and some seasons it's 15 or 20. Um, but the question is always, are these the right people to work with? Uh, and do they care about what we're doing? And are they going to teach and share? Selling our genes as a, as a person uh, on the sales floor, and it, is, it can be really fun because there is so much to tell about what we do, how we do it, where we do it, why we do it, um, a lot of the details in the gene, and it's all it's all real. <laughs> it's not just a marketing story. They're, they're things that we actually do because we believe in them. Um, and you do give the people the tools to tell those stories, right? Because you provide those videos. Yep. And, and, and it seems like stores respond to that because you're in distribution, for example, at Barney's. Is that correct? Yeah, but we have been for so, so what do you think is in it for the retailers that take you up and what's the role of e-commerce? Is, is that ever more important? So for the retailers, uh, what's in it for them is an interesting brand that's not available everywhere, uh, that has a real story, that fits, it's very important. E-commerce is obviously an incredibly important part of the business and of any business at this point. For us, it is a part of the strategy. Um, it's not the strategy. I, I really believe in this old school kind of like the guy that runs the shop in a smaller town, paying attention to the market and bringing things in that he likes and then having multiple things there to touch and feel and try on. You know, we're making a product that you're putting on your body that's going to touch half of the skin on your body for days and days at a time. It's a very intimate thing. Um, I think if we, if we think about the entire economy as a market, yes, e-commerce is probably the most important thing. Um, in clothing, it's a very important thing, but you still need to touch and try on, and you still need some guidance on how the fabric moves or what size to get or to size down or not. Um, there, there are so many considerations there that are hard to, hard to address online. 
But our jeans are not available in every store, and there are a lot of people that have had a pair of our jeans that understand what we're doing, that want to buy them, but but don't have a local shop. So we do offer, you know, what we do online, and, and it's a balance. I don't know what the percentages, you know, should be or will look like in the future, um, but I know that there's something different about what we're doing compared to, you know, selling commodities that don't necessarily, that aren't as intimate or that don't uh, require as much knowledge or education. Just hearing you talk about your brand and your plans, you say it's intimate and it sounds very much intimate and in love. I mean, we have a chapter in our book, which is called living the dream in terms of, you know, manifesting your brand, whether it's in the store in manufacturing or other, and it really feels like you are actually living and operating and making product. It is really your dream. So we're already up on time here. Thanks again a lot for sharing this intimate story about Raleigh denim with us, Victor. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. If people want to know more about Raleigh denim now, and I guess quite a few do want to, you know, what's the best way to approach you? Know, where can they find you? Uh, well, you can check on our website, uh, raleighdenimworkshop.com. At the bottom, there's a link uh, to all of our wholesale accounts so you can check if there's an account in your city where you can go you can support them and, and see the jeans in person there uh, otherwise you can order from from the website and and in raleigh if they come to raleigh you're right downtown we are we're on martin street um right next to the contemporary art museum <laughs> excellent and you dear listener you can of course reach us at info at uberbrands.com and that's spelled with a ue as it should be if you like the podcast tell us about it tell others about it rate it and if you want to hear more uber brand stories or how they do it you can always pick up our book rethinking prestige branding or if you even seek to elevate your own brand that again just let us know we're at info at uberbrands.com and with that, I want to say goodbye and thanks again, Victor, and uh, talk to you all next time. Tschüss.